This morning, we have a very special Grand Rounds. One of our own chief residents, Margaret Harrison, is presenting this morning. Yay. Um, Margaret joined us here from Colorado. She went to the University of Colorado for undergraduate um, and medical school. While there, she uh, became an EMT, which I did not know about you, um, and inspired her to go to medical school. Uh, she's one of our administrative chief residents here, um, keeps everyone in line. Um, and uh, uh, well, after this, we'll be returning to Colorado to, uh, for a job as a generalist. So welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Bizzuto, um, and everyone for coming. Um, so like Dr. Bazzuto said, I'm Margaret. I'm one of the fourth year residents. Um, and my talk today will be on cannabis and reproductive health, taking a look at what we know about the impacts on preconception, gestational and fetal outcomes. Uh, I do not have any disclosures. Um, and the learning objectives for today's talk will be First, um, kind of to summarize the status of cannabis legalization across the country, the availability and the usage of cannabis in our patients. Um, we're gonna look at the sources of information that our patients are getting and the accuracy of that information. We'll look at what existing evidence we do have regarding the impact of cannabis around reproductive health. Um, we'll try to interpret that data so that we can try to have some take home points to give to our patients. Um, and I'll end with some resources that are available for providers outside of this talk. So starting with the background, um, as we all know, marijuana laws have been changing very rapidly um, across the country. Back in 2012, Colorado and Washington were the first states that legalized recreational marijuana, and they did so through the use of ballot initiatives. Uh, most recently, Ohio was the 24th state to legalize recreational marijuana, and that happened just in November 2023. So now, at this point, more than half of the U.S. population lives in a state where it is legal um, to use recreational marijuana. And even though in Wisconsin, we have not had any lawmakers who have introduced any legislation to move towards legalization, many of our local governments here are working to decriminalize things. So for example, um, in Madison, it's legal for you to possess up to 28 grams of marijuana, though it's still not legal to buy and sell. Um, in Milwaukee, they've re reduced the fine down to $1. So it's essentially decriminalized there. Um, so even though cannabis remains illegal to buy and sell in Wisconsin, um, over the past four years, it has been legalized in three of our neighboring states. Um, that includes Minnesota, Michigan, and Illinois. Um, and that's made it increasingly easy for Wisconsinites to have a way to obtain marijuana through what might seem either legal or less risky than it was in the past. Um, this map was published in 2023 by the Wisconsin Policy Forum. It shows that about 50% of all Wisconsinites in, of legal age live within about an hour drive from a recreational dispensary, um, including all residents of major cities like Madison and Milwaukee. Um, and then since this was published, Minnesota passed additional legislation to allow for recreational as well as medical marijuana. So these numbers have only increased. Um, and at this point, marijuana is by far the most popular and the most accessible drug in America. Um, along with those legislative, legislative changes, there is a growing acceptance that marijuana is overall really low risk. Um, the legalization of marijuana has probably played a large contributing role in that, uh, but there's also really large advocacy organizations and a lot of business interests that are working hard to kind of promote the idea that marijuana is safe. Um, about 75% of Americans are reported to believe that marijuana is less risky than tobacco use, less risky than alcohol use, less risky than taking pain medications. Um, and then along with believing that it's overall less risky for a general, the general population, um, one study that showed that the perception that there are no risks associated with cannabis use in pregnancy has increased about threefold over the last 15 years. Um, so today about one in five Americans think that cannabis use is totally okay in pregnancy with no known risks. Um, and these perceptions are all despite kind of universal statements uh, from all the major medical organizations, ACOG, AFP, AAP, 
that all um, recommend against use in pregnancy. Um, the reported prevalence of cannabis use in pregnancy varies very widely in the literature. Um, it ranges between three and 30%. Um, but data do consistently support that that prevalence is increasing over time with the increasing um, legalization. And multiple studies have shown that the highest prevalence is in the first trimester compared with the second and third. The prevalence overall is likely underreported. Uh, multiple studies have demonstrated that self-reported marijuana sampling um, and biological sampling do not tend to match. Uh, Self-report tends to underestimate prenatal marijuana use at least two to three times um, compared to when they look at urine toxicology studies. You know, some of that variation may be because we don't really have a gold standard on how to test for marijuana exposure during pregnancy. Um, but a lot of that is probably because of the challenges with self-reporting um, due to perceived percussions of repercussions of disclosure possible recall bias of using marijuana early in pregnancy before they knew they were pregnant, um, or the fact that many of these studies were either conducted a long time ago or were done in states where um, it's more heavily criminalized. Uh, but this prevalence is only predicted to increase. Um, because of the challenges in knowing the true prevalence of use in pregnancy, relatively little is known about the predictors for who's at risk for cannabis use. In pregnancy, um, the data that we do have suggests that patients are higher risk if they're younger, if they're white, if they have lower education, lower income, if they have other mental health conditions, use other substances, um, and if they have either an unintended pregnancy or limited or dis disrupted prenatal care. Um, along with the increasing prevalence of use, um, we also know that the potency of marijuana products uh, continues to increase. So THC is the psychoactive ingredient in cannabis, and the concentration can depend on a lot of different factors during uh, the production of the product. Um, but multiple studies have demonstrated that over the last 40 years, there's been a significant increase in the potency, um, up to 30 times the level that it previously was. Um, it's now possible to mass produce plants with much higher potencies um, with concerted monitoring, which has caused this dramatic increase. And then when they look at the overall market share, they can see that higher potency products also are taking up a bigger part of the market, so they are more available than the low potency products. And then we are very briefly going to review the pharmacology of cannabis just to provide some background into ideas of the mechanisms behind some of the effects that we'll be going through later in the presentation. So cannabis or marijuana um, works on our endogenous endocannabinoid system. Um, we have two receptors. CB1 and CB2 that it binds to. Um, THC is metabolized by the liver um, and the half-life can range anywhere from 24 hours to four to five days in heavier users. It may require up to 30 days for it to be completely excreted. Um, and THC is small, it's lipophilic, it easily crosses the placenta um, and fetal plasma levels are known to be about 10% of the maternal plasma levels. Um, though much higher concentrations have been reported with repeated exposures. Um, so our endocannabinoid system, um, like I said, it easily crosses the placenta, but because it's lipophilic, it also easily crosses the blood-brain barrier. It can accumulate in fetal tissues, particularly the brain. Um, so those receptors, CB1 and CB2, they are pretty widespread throughout the body, but they're particularly prevalent on the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, as well as the male and repro female reproductive tract. Um, this signaling system has regulation over motor control, memory, um, executive brain functions. Um, and components of the system are present during embryonic central nervous system development as early as 16 days gestation. Um, right around the time when the neural plate and the neural tube are being established. There are also some endocannabinoid receptors on the beta cells of the pancreas, which I only bring up because it might relate to some changes in fetal growth that we see with cannabis use. 
Um, and finally, I just want to quickly review different types of ex exogenous products. Um, there are a variety of modes of consumption, smoking, vaping, eating, or topical use. Um, so what's the difference for us? Why does it matter when we look at it? Um, patients who inhale um, have a faster onset of those effects. And those effects, um, they also come with uh, the known lung harmful lung effects um, associated with inhalation, whereas ingestion has a delayed onset. It doesn't reach its peak for up to an hour. Um, so it avoids those toxic effects on the lung, but it does come with an increased risk of overdose or toxicity. Um, and since edible products have become more available, we know that uh, visits to the emergency department for intoxication are increasing. Um, topical products like lotions or patches are not psychoactive and do not enter the bloodstream. So next, we're going to take a look at where patients are currently getting their information about cannabis from. Um, pregnant women who are interested in using marijuana may refrain from seeking information from their healthcare providers due to fear of legal repercussions. Um, and so instead, they may seek advice from some other sources. Um, our patients often turn to dispensaries for advice as they consider those employees kind of like the experts in their field. Um, one study in Colorado used a mystery caller approach. They contact, contacted um, 400 different dispensaries across the state just soliciting advice about cannabis product use. The caller claimed to be eight weeks pregnant um, and asked for recommendations about products that they could be using in early pregnancy. In that study, about 70% of the dispensaries that they contacted did end up recommending some kind of cannabis product for use of nausea in pregnancy. Um, only 37% of those pharmacies were licensed for medical sale. Some of the quotes from that study are up on the screen, uh, but some examples are things like, you know, technically, with you being pregnant, I don't think you should, you're supposed to be consuming that. But if I were to suggest something, I'd suggest something high in THC. Um, or things like edibles wouldn't hurt the child, they'd just be going through your digestional tract. Um, up to 80% of dispensaries did eventually recommend that they talk to a healthcare provider, uh, but the majority of those needed prompting prior to doing that. Um, studies have also shown you know, kind of outside of pregnancy that the advice that's given out by dispensaries is largely based on just personal opinion or anecdotal evidence um, rather than any medical basis. And most dispensaries don't require any formal or medical training about their products. <laughs> Patients may also look at the labels on their products for information on safety. Um, as the use of marijuana has expanded, the variety of products that are available has also increased, um, but the regulation and the quality assurance, particularly for edible products, is severely lacking. Um, studies that have evaluated the accuracy of labeling shows that um, they are accurate between 12 and 30% of the time, some of the time being way over-labeled, sometimes under-labeled, um, and some products that are labeled as CBD only or marketed to not have any THC or psychoactive ingredient actually do have THC in um, amounts that are sufficient to cause intoxication. And then multiple studies have shown that consumers frequently use the internet as their first source of information um, and consider that collective wisdom found on social media to be reliable and overall credible. Um, However, on social media, there's extensive presence of overt marketing to consumers of marijuana um, without really any regulatory oversight. The public can both seek and share information about the medicinal use of cannabis, which can result in potentially biased information. Um, and that shared information is not usually well supported by scientific evidence. Um, and looking at, in looking at posts related to marijuana use in pregnancy, major themes do include do usually cover health topics, um, things like safe use in pregnancy, safe use postpartum, um, and how to use marijuana to manage pregnancy-related symptoms. Um, so patients may post on a number of different platforms with largely personal or anecdotal experiences. 
So despite the convenience and support that's offered by social media and web-based forums, consumers should be aware that that information is unregulated. And so these flaws in the current options for patients to get their information about cannabis use are obviously greatly lacking. Um, and this was really the primary driver of my talk today because I do think that health professionals need to be more proactive in obtaining and disseminating accurate information so that we can help patients reach more informed decisions about their health. Um, okay, so looking at the short-term effects of marijuana, marijuana use in the short term has been associated with several different adver adverse outcomes during intoxication. It can in interfere with things like cognitive function, memory, perception of time. It can make it challenging to learn or retain information. Um, it can affect your motor coordination, which can interfere with driving and has been shown to increase chance of motor vehicle accidents or risk of injury. Um, and in high doses, there is a risk of developing severe paranoia or psychosis. Despite um, contentious discussions about the addictiveness of marijuana, there is evidence that shows that long-term use can lead to addiction. Approximately 9% of patients who use marijuana do go on to develop an addiction, um, and that number is only higher for patients who start using earlier in their life, particularly in adolescence. Um, adults who started to smoke regularly during adolescence have been shown to have impaired neural connectivity in specific regions of their brain. It results in measurable and long-lasting impairments. Um, the cognitive changes can jeopardize educational, professional, or so social achievements. And the evidence is mixed kind of regarding whether these impairments are reversible with cessation or whether they're persistent and have the potential to worsen with consistent use. With inhalation, patients may develop chronic lung, chronic lung inflammation, which can result in symptoms of chronic bronchitis. There is some limited evidence to suggest increased risk of lung cancer though it's challenging to kind of separate that out from tobacco use. Um, and chronic use may lead to changes in the vasculature, increased risk for vasculopathies, leading to things like heart attacks, TIAs, or strokes. Um, and for patients particularly who have a predisposition, use of marijuana can trigger or increase symptoms of psychosis. Um, and then there is something called cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. So this syndrome is a paradoxical condition, uh, in which long-term cannabis users develop intractable nausea and vomiting that may last days at a time. Um, unlike other vomiting syndromes, it can be, be relieved by things like hot showers or the use of topical capsaicin cream. Uh, there are no labs or images that can aid in this diagnosis, so it's really based just on clinical symptoms, and the diagnosis is confirmed if they're symptoms resolve after they've stopped use for a year. According to the most recent DSM-5, there is only one main mental health disorder caused by cannabis use, uh, and it all follow, falls under the umbrella of cannabis use disorder. Um, symptoms that are included in the criteria are things like needing increased dosage to, to maintain the same effect, having increased tolerance, experience withdrawal symptoms, having it interfere with your life, experiencing cravings. Having two to three symptoms is considered mild cannabis use disorder, while six or more um, is defined as severe. And most of the long-term effects of marijuana that are summarized here have been observed among just heavy or longer-term users. There are multiple, often hidden, confounding factors that detract from our ability to establish causality for any of these effects. So the New England Journal of Medicine published this table um, trying to convey the level of confidence that we have about these effects. Um, in this table, they noted that we have the highest confidence in the potential for addiction, uh, the diminished lifetime achievement, motor vehicle accidents, um, and symptoms of bronchitis. We have medium confidence in the association with abnormal brain development, schizophrenia, depression, and anxiety. And there's low confidence in the association with marijuana use and lung cancer.
And then this talk would be incomplete without mentioning that there is ongoing research into potential benefits of marijuana for different health conditions. There's current evidence that supports use in epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, glaucoma, nausea, chronic pain, and AIDS, anorexia, and wasting syndrome. Okay, and then moving on to the hazy evidence that surrounds use in pregnancy. So despite a lack of evidence for the safety of cannabis use during pregnancy, pregnant women may explore the use for a multiple of, multitude of symptoms. Those include things like pregnancy-related nausea, insomnia, anxiety, or mood disorders, appetite changes, or chronic pain. Um, but most of the studies show that pregnant women who do use marijuana are not doing so for recreational use only. They are usually trying to treat a symptom. Um, even though cannabis is not approved for treatment of nausea in pregnancy, one study that showed that about 50% of patients that were using were doing so for nausea of those 92% of them found it to be either very effective or extremely effective for treatment of their symptoms. Uh, the data surrounding the effects of regu regular marijuana use on preconception and fertility is very mixed. Um, some studies suggest that an association, there is an association with increased rates of ovulatory dysfunction, some decreased pregnancy rates despite increased frequency of intercourse. Other observational or retrospective studies have noted really no significant impacts on spontaneous conception rates or times to conception. Um, animal models have shown that they're, with chronic use, you may have higher rates of anovulation or longer cycles. Um, but there is an exception to this, which comes to evaluating patients specifically using assisted reproductive technology. Multiple prospective studies have demonstrated that for women using assisted reproductive technologies, they have fewer oocytes that are retrieved during IVF cycles, they have fewer oocytes that are fertilized, and they have higher rates of pregnancy loss. In one study that looked at chronic THC use in monkeys, there was a dose-dependent decrease in things like testicular volume, increased gonadotropin levels, and decreased sex, sex serum, sex steroids. Um, these findings together suggested primary testicular failure, uh, but they did not result in any statistically significant changes in the semen parameters or any clinically significant changes for outcomes. There have been multiple adverse maternal health outcomes that have been evaluated to look for correlation or causation. There is a clear association, kind of like I talked about, with the development of cannabis hyperemesis syndrome with heavy use. Um, one meta-analysis did demonstrate an increased risk of maternal anemia with use. Um, and there are fewer smaller studies that show some correlation with increased risk of precipitous labor lasting less than three hours um, and with increased rates of manual placental removal. To date, there has not been any association with any of the other outcomes that are listed on the screen. And then now we're going to move on to the effects, the neonatal effects. Um, so several studies have evaluated newborn birth weights um, and multiple biometric parameters after in utero exposure. A meta-analysis demonstrated that marijuana use alone was not associated with increased risk of low birth weight. However, when they stratified by the amount of use, women who were using at least weekly were significantly more likely to give birth to a small for gestational age infant. This result is supported by a retrospective study that was published even after the meta-analysis, which also found a modest increase in low birth weight infants. These graphs both come from a large prospective cohort study that included 10,000 pregnant persons. They conducted serial growth ultrasounds throughout the pregnancies. Um, they found that cannabis use during pregnancy was associated with reduced growth when used in early pregnancy, but that was particularly true for patients who continued to use into the second and third trimester. Um, the relationship was noted to be dose dependent and for the heaviest users, a difference of 277 grams at birth was reported. There are some smaller studies that have also noted smaller birth lengths, smaller head circumferences, 
and those are more pronounced with increased use in early pregnancy, particularly the first and second trimester. Um, so there are a few mechanisms that are proposed for causing fetal growth restriction with marijuana use. Um, with inhalation, you know, similar to tobacco use, there is an idea that the increased carboxyhemoglobin levels in the blood lead to decreased placental blood flow and can uh, restrict fetal growth in that way. Um, I mentioned that there are cannabinoid receptors on the beta cells of the pancreas. When our endogenous um, cannabinoids bind to those receptors, it decreases insulin. So there is some theory that decreasing the insulin-like growth factors during pregnancy might lead to decreased fetal growth. Um, and then there are some epiphenomena that come with maternal use, those things like stress, chronic nausea or vomiting, co-use of other substances, or poor nutritional status that could also be contributing. There are a few studies that have looked at preterm birth as a primary outcome um, in prospective cohort, stu cohort studies. An odds ratio of 2.1 for increased risk of preterm birth was demonstrated. However, when it was pool, pooled and adjusted for other substances such as tobacco, that association was no longer present. When patients use tobacco and marijuana together, the risk does seem to be additive. So having a greater risk of preterm birth than use of either substance by itself. There is limited data about the effects of marijuana use on stillbirth. This is true even more so than other um, studied outcomes because patients with stillbirth are often excluded from obstetric studies. There is a stillbirth collaborative research network that con conducted one case control study over a two year period. They demonstrated a dose response relationship with marijuana use and stillbirth. Um, this population reported a twofold increase in the risk of stillbirth among women with positive umbilical cord sampling uh, for cannabis. And a meta-analysis of 31 observational and case control studies also came to the same conclusions that compared with non-users, marijuana users experienced simil similar rates of perinatal death but had higher stillbirth rates and their risk ratio reported was 1.7. One um, retrospective cohort study that included 6,400 women did demonstrate an increased rate of NICU admissions among women who uh, used marijuana compared to those who did not um, in non-tobacco users. The reported odds ratio for that was 1.5, um, but this study also showed a concerning trend um, that leaned towards prolonged neonatal hospitalization and perinatal mortality, but those findings were not statistically significant. Available evidence that we have does not conclusively suggest that marijuana causes structural anatomic defects in humans. In one large study, the association of marijuana usage and major malformations was elevated at 1.3, but it was not statistically significant. There was a study from the National Birth Defects Prevention Study um, where cases of marijuana use during the month before and the first three months of pregnancy were compared with non-users. The study found no associations between marijuana use and 20 major anomalies. Um, however, when it was re restricted to marijuana use just in the first month of pregnancy, the odds of anencephaly in the offspring was significantly increased to 2.5 times the level. This finding could be confounded because there is a separate observation that patients that use marijuana are also less likely to be taking their folic acid supplementation. Um, some limit limitations that are specific to the data around congenital anomalies can be attributed to the difficulties in detecting anomalies during their initial hospitalization. Sometimes they're detected later um, and those outcomes aren't necessarily followed up. Um, and many most studies do not specifically address the timing of marijuana use or the dosage of marijuana use um, to, to be able to detect use during those critical first months of pregnancy when all of the organs are forming. Okay, and then looking at neurodevelopment. So when we look at animal models, um, 
They have demonstrated that endocannabinoids do play a key role in normal fetal brain development. Those include development of the neurotransmitter systems, neuronal proliferation, migration, differentiation, and survival. Human fetuses exhibit central nervous system cannabinoid receptors very early in pregnancy, um, and that receptor density increases with advancing gestational age. Um, this suggests a role for endocannabinoids in normal human brain development. The known physiology of that system could explain the concerning neurologic and neurodevelopment, no, neurodevelopmental outcomes that have been documented in infants uh, prenatally exposed to marijuana. So studies that use laboratory animals have shown that in utero exogenous exposure may disrupt normal brain development. It's been associated with increased sensitivity to other drugs of abuse um, and increased susceptibility to things like alcohol in utero um, or fetal alcohol syndrome. In newborns, using marijuana in utero has been associated with exaggerated and prolonged startle responses and alterations in their sleep patterns. Um, and as they grow up, children between age one and four have noted um, that they had lower scores on visual problem solving, on motor coordination and visual analysis than children who were not exposed. Some studies suggest that the deficits in early development may not persist beyond that age, but that data is pretty mixed. Um, and then there is an association with decreased attention span and behavioral problems. Effects of prenatal marijuana on school performance um, are fairly mixed. There is um, some evidence that school performance among children between five and 12 um, have lower reading scores, lower spelling scores, lower teacher perceived school performance. Um, there was a longitudinal prospective cohort study that found a pretty consistent pattern of deficits in cognitive functioning, um, resulting in lower scores of verbal reasoning, short-term memory, IQ scores. Um, the effects were associated with increased rates of hyperactivity, impulsivity, um, and, and inattention problems, as well as increased rates of childhood depression symptoms. Prenatal marijuana use is also known to be an independent predictor of marijuana use by age 14. There is some data that maternal cannabis may alter the development of the neonatal dopamine system, um, causing a predisposition for addiction later in life. Um, one study that looked at postmortem human fetal brains for elective terminations looked at the dopamine receptors between marijuana users and non-marijuana users, and those dopamine receptors were significantly increased in a dose-responsive way uh, for marijuana users. There is really insufficient data to evaluate the effects of marijuana use on infants during lactation and breastfeeding. This data is really challenging since it's very difficult to control for use only in the postpartum period without studying women who used during pregnancy. We do know, as I mentioned, that THC is lipophilic. It is transferred into the breast milk. Uh, the concentration tends to peak about one hour after inhalation um, and is estimated to be about 2.5% of the maternal dose. In the absence of data, women should be informed of the potential risks and the known transfer of marijuana into their breast milk. So before moving on, I just wanted to reiterate, if it wasn't clear that the data that we currently have and that I've presented all comes with a lot of limitations. Um, animals are really poor surrogates for the outcomes that are, we are attempting to study on humans. Um, and studies on humans are often very heavily confounded by things like polysubstance use and a multi multitude of other factors that we cannot control for. Many of these studies are limited by selection bias and really just studying volunteer patients. These volunteers in some cases were in states or at times in the past when marijuana was illegal or more heavily criminalized. They're also subject to classification bias by defining marijuana use by self-report rather than biological sampling. Um, and when sampling is utilized, we know that 
the predictive value of that can be affected by either the amount used or the frequency of use or the patient's BMI. Many of these studies report difficulty adjusting for tobacco use or for use of other drugs. Many have small sample sizes or do not adequately study or report the timing, the frequency, or the quantity of cannabis use. So with that in mind, I will move on to how to evaluate and help our patients. Okay, so moving on to how we evaluate our patients. Um, one study that I found really focused in on the patient and healthcare provider screening communication regarding substance use in pregnancy. This study recorded OB visits from five, five clinics, recording um, 480 total patients, um, and they ended up evaluating 460 patient encounters. Um, among those recorded visits, about 19% of patients disclosed use of marijuana to their provider, um, and 90% of those disclosures occurred during a provider-initiated screening about illicit drug use or marijuana use. Um, the five domains of responses that could have come from their provider fell into different categories, things like no counseling, punitive counseling, helpful and supportive counseling, or kind of like unclear counseling. Um, and nearly half those visits where the patients disclosed their use, um, obstetric healthcare providers offered no counseling or information. Um, and in a quarter of those visits, the provider did not even acknowledge that the patient had disclosed that to them. This study really shows high rates of either insufficient or completely absent counseling. And when it did occur, the counseling tended to focus on either legal or child protective services implications rather than on medical or pregnancy complications. Um, and this does demonstrate, I think, a big opportunity for clinicians to engage with patients and provide information that they're looking for. So while we have reviewed all the evidence that we currently have, as well as the limitations of the data, I do think that we have some information worth sharing with patients. At this point, we do not have data to support any benefits of the use of marijuana in pregnancy. We have not established amount of marijuana that is considered safe. We have evidence to suggest that there are potential harms to either the birthing person or their pregnancy. And those things include low birth weight, preterm delivery, stillbirth, respiratory complications, cognitive deficits, um, and higher rates of anxiety and depression. Depending on the underlying reason of use by the patient, since as we discussed, most patients are using this in order to treat some symptom that they're having, uh, we can tailor the support that we offer them to suit their needs, whether that is nausea or mood symptoms. We can also try to provide assistance in supporting them in cessation, the same way that we have been supporting we have been trained to support women intending to stop tobacco use in pregnancy. Okay. And taking a look at the bigger picture um, and what we can do at a systems level to improve patient care, there are some well-studied methods for, for prevention and reduction of substance use. When evaluating program effectiveness, it's difficult to isolate programs that are focused exclusively on preventing marijuana use. So the best evidence that we have really consists of pre prevention research for other substances. Um, one tool that's often used by obstetricians and primary care providers is something called SBIRT or screening, brief intervention, and referral to resources and treatment. Um, this uses validating, validated screening questions um, to assess whether the patient may or may not have an issue with cannabis use, um, uses motivational interviewing when a problem is identified to try to assess whether the patient is ready to make changes and offers referrals to resources or treatment that can be provided. Integrated clinics are kind of like one-stop shops. They typically involve um, a multi multidisciplinary approach so they may have counseling for substance use disorders, for mental health, they may have parenting or child development services, as well as prenatal care, kind of all in one place. Um, and the clinics are designed to promote health equity uh, by helping patients at increased risk. The model has been around since the 1970s, but these clinics are not incredibly common, unfortunately. Uh, 
all foam model does adopt some of the principles and key elements um, to address risk factors and behaviors that can impact outcomes. One example of these two methods is with the Kaiser Permanente Early Start Program. This program is in California. It integrates substance use prevention and treatment services into routine prenatal, prenatal care visits. This clinic has a full-time licensed specialist in substance use addiction, um, one for every 1,800 births. And they've demonstrated really positive outcomes. About more than two thirds of the patients in the program reported a complete abstinence during pregnancy. They have seen fewer preterm births, fewer stillborn births, stillborn births, and overall lower cost of maternal health care. Health communication campaigns can also be implemented to promote change or produce outcomes for public health. They are meant to provide accurate, direct information to the public via multiple methods um, to try to influence adoption of healthy behaviors for the general public. There's pretty limited research about the effectiveness of campaigns like this on marijuana use, but it has been used effectively to change beliefs about tobacco use. They require a lot of thoughtful planning, however, um, as recently there was a campaign that was put out um, somewhat aggressive messaging about alcohol use in pregnancy and following the campaign, they actually found worse maternal outcomes and higher healthcare costs. One example of a successful campaign is the Tips from Former Smoking campaign. This uh, campaign was launched in, launched in 2012 by the CDC, uh, it used stories of patients who had long-term health effects either from smoking themselves or from secondhand hand smoke. It was estimated to have reached about 75% of U.S. adults um, and was associated with increased rates of smoking cessation. Contingency management um, is one of the most effective approaches for treating substance use disorders. This relies on operant conditioning or basically providing rewards for individuals who are willing to um, make a behavior change. Many programs use this practice during pregnancy, um, and it has been proven effective to help pregnant women quit smoking or abstain from cocaine or heroin use. Um, and big drawbacks are essentially that it can be more of like a short-term fix and patients may go back to using kind of once that brief period of incentives um, goes away. One effective example of this program is called Baby and Me Tobacco Free. Um, this program was an initiative that was created to reduce the impact of tobacco use on pregnant and postpartum women. During pregnancy, the women would go to counseling sessions, and if they did quit um, smoking, then they were rewarded with incentives like diaper vouchers. Um, they were also encouraged to attend postpartum, and they were eligible to continue to receive incentives up to 12 months postpartum. We all know that the postpartum period can be a really risky time for women um, in a lot of ways, but they can also relapse or engage in substance misuse. Um, and approximately one in nine women experience postpartum depression, and there are a lot of stressors that come with caring with a newborn. Uh, one of the most studied practices to help women cope with challenges is home visitation, um, and multiple studies have demonstrated both maternal and child outcome improvements with postpartum visits. The University of New Mexico has a program for pregnant people with alcohol and substance use history that's meant to prevent and treat substance use during and after pregnancy. The treatment plans are really customized um, and they have a number of different services available, high-risk prenatal care, substance use, domestic violence resources, trauma support, relapse prevention, and they have seen really positive outcomes for cessation and for prevention. And then finally, while there are concerns that implementation of punitive strategies may deter patients from seeking health care, either during or after pregnancy with regards to their substance use, we know that some policies have been effective in helping decrease rates of adolescent use, uh, particularly around alcohol. Um, so lawmakers that have enacted policies like um, the minimal legal age, a lower blood alcohol concentration, and limiting commercial and social access to adolescents for alcohol advertising has made a big impact. 
um, but there's not very much research on how those policies could have similar positive effects for adolescent marijuana use. An example of this, as I mentioned, is the advertising restriction. So um, there were laws put into place that restricted the ability of alcohol advertisers to market specifically towards adolescents. This has shown a decrease in consumption among adolescents um, and policy restrictions like this could potentially uh, provide some benefit, maybe establishing a distance threshold away from school zones um, or pro prohibiting advertising in student publications. And then finally, I just have some provider resources um, if you are interested in learning more outside of the talk today. This first resource is a toolkit that is intended for harm reduction of all types of substance use during pregnancy. This was created by the National Harm Reduction Coalition. The toolkit includes a discussion of navigating challenging discussions with patients in a respectful, non-stigmatizing manner. Um, and it really covers harm reduction strategies. So this is the idea that if we can't completely eliminate the harm, then we should at least do our best to mitigate it or minimize it um, and help patients achieve that. Uh, one example that they give um, is talking about patients through if they plan to use marijuana postpartum while they're breastfeeding, suggesting that they breastfeed right before use um, in order to minimize the amount that's going into their breast milk. Um, the Colorado Department of Public Health has also compiled a lot of great resources that's continuously updated, both for providers and for patients. They have resources that are specific to pregnancy, lactation, and adolescents and are tailored um, to patients or providers. They have also created a free online trading module that can be found at this website. Um, it's meant to disseminate research, the most up-to-date research, review pregnancy and breastfeeding guidelines, and cover additional safety topics. So in conclusion, despite the limitations and the data that we have reviewed, because there are worrisome trends and in indicating potential negative effects on fetal and maternal outcomes, patients who are pregnant or contemplating pregnancy should be encouraged to discontinue marijuana use. Because the effects of marijuana use may be as serious as those of cigarette smoking or alcohol use, marijuana should be avoided if possible during pregnancy. Before pregnancy and in early pregnancy, all women should be screened for use of marijuana as well as other substances and referred to treatment if they desire it. Um, women who are reporting marijuana use should be counseled about the potential concerns for adverse health outcomes if they continue to use during their pregnancy. These include things like fetal growth restriction, which is something that we have the strongest evidence for, but also some concern that there is an increased rate of stillbirth altered fetal neurodevelopment. And they should be informed um, that the purpose of screening is not to punish them or prosecute them, but in order to provide health, health, helpful health information and help them have a healthy pregnancy. These are my references. Thank you. Margaret, did you find any reference to like differences in outcomes between states that have legalized marijuana in different ways in states that have not? Not really. A lot of the data right now is coming from states that have legalized it because as it's federally not legal, it's very difficult to obtain research funding unless you live in a state that has separate like state-based funding. And so now more of the data is emerging from states like Colorado, Washington, or Oregon with the most liberal laws. Um, so those, it's hard to say how generalizable that is to other states that it's not as legal. Thanks, I learned so much from your presentation. That was great. <clears throat> when you do a UDS on OB here, does that include marijuana? And if so, what are the implications of that? It does include marijuana when we do it here. We do it so rarely um, that I actually don't know the implications. Maybe Dr. McDonald does, because he's raising his hand. Wisconsin has a statute that says that we are an optional reporting state for toxicology that is positive for mom during pregnancy. So in some places, patients can be subject to, you know, legal liability if they are tested. So generally our strategy locally has been to not test 
unless a patient particularly asks. So one time when I might consider that is if I have a patient who is using marijuana that's not from a dispensary, I might talk to them about the risks of it being laced with things like fentanyl. And so they might ask to be tested for that reason.